My fascination really since the early 70s has been to visit extant local square dance communities. And one thing that I've noticed is that each community has a set structure to the dance. Um, and that structure remains a kind of a touchstone for that community. Um, the figure might change with each dance, but the general overall structure remains the same, and that's what allows people to basically know what they're doing, oh. you know, without having to be walked through or taught. Um, and I always find it interesting that a lot of younger callers kind of in the maybe following more in the Western square, traditional Western square dance tradition, they want to have a figure, a distinctive figure that they teach. And then they also want to have a distinctive break for each dance. Um, and in my experience in Appalachian dance and all the dances in the Midwest and the um, Middle Atlantic area that I visited, the breaks were very set and remain pretty much the same. So, as you'll probably see in my workshop tomorrow morning in, in the town of Maryland Line, they basically have two introductory figures, one which they'll, they'll choose between. One is just a circle left, followed by a grand right and left. The other is an alaman left, followed by a grand right and left. Um, and those will be the same in every dance, one of those two. And it'll be the ending as well, usually. Um, and other, with a lot of the other dances, it was very simple, set, Alaman left, grand right and left, kind of a break, and then a different figure for each dance. Um, in, in the big circle style, again, you might have a choice of one or two things at the end of the dance, but usually you'll have a very set opener, and, it, and often it would be as simple as, circle left, circle right, swing your partner and promenade. And that would be the same every dance. Um, then you'd have a, a dance a bunch of figures, couple up four and dance a bunch of figures. And then you would often, maybe the one big choice that the caller could make would be at the end of the dance, you could do walk the king's highway or the queen's highway, or you could do a grand right and left all the way around the circle or you could do an elbow swing all the way around the circle, or you could do a big basket figure. I mean, there might be a choice of three or four things that you could do. Um, but, but I didn't encounter a lot of improvisation. Uh, and you'd pretty much have the same kind of program every single meeting of that particular dance community with that particular caller. Uh, with the same, even the same music a lot. Most of the traditional dances that I went to, most of them had either one caller, who was the same caller every time, or multiple callers who called exactly the same, who had all learned from the same person, maybe. So what does that mean for callers today who are not working in traditional settings? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, mean, I, I think it means that they have to, I would think, if you're going to attract, have, have a, a dance that's going to be an ongoing thing, I think you need to establish some kinds of, you know, a structure um, or something so that you can minimize the amount of teaching that you have to do. And you might have to pick and choose what that structure is going to be. And I think the contra dance craze bears this out that that it's really the ultimately it's the music that draw, that drives the dancing, not not the variety of figures that you do. Yeah. If the music's exciting, you can do the same dance. You, you can do lots of stuff, and not it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah. Um, and people will enjoy it.